Welcome, daring men of God. I'm so glad you're here. Monday night, men cranking it up. Men answering the call to courageous manhood. Going through the book, Daring. But really, it's not just about a book report. It's about what God's doing in our hearts. I love this uh, quote that, that Lauren, Pastor Lauren Tebbett gave me from Calgary. He said, it's an old Scottish proverb that says this, if you don't have blood on your kilt, then you're just a dancer. <laughs> Man, that says it right there. You know, the thing is this, is victory is always on the other side of a fight. You and I were born in the middle of cosmic chaos, but Jesus was born in the middle of terrorist occupation. And we were called to this fight. You were put here on earth for this mission, you and I, and we are not going to back off. We're going to be daring men. Let's look at what it says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, New Living Translation. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. That means a sound mind. Now, let me read it in the Amplified for you, and David can put that up. For God did not give, not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. Man, how many of us want to live like that? Calm, well-balanced, self-control. Well-balanced in our thinking, our mind. And that's what God's given us. And it comes back to personal discipline, which is doing this. Doing the hard work of building character. Going through the materials. Read stuff. Go through it. Go to cmn.men. If you've got a men's group, we've got, you know, the workbooks uh, that we go through. I've got, we've got... 900,000 men a month going through those materials uh, all over the world and over 100 nations. So grab that, get a hold of it, cmn.men. Bottom line is you and I are going to do the hard work. That's what being a daring man is about. See, this, this Bible is not just a lifestyle thing. It's not just like, hey, this is going to help me live a better life. It is a book of moral courage. It is a book about Jesus the, the world obsessively is leaning into negativity. But when we get this in our hearts and lives, we live in a spirit of, of uh, courage, strength. Let's go back to it. Calm, well-balanced mind, self-control. Now, that's not easy all the time, is it? No, it's not. But daring is to live with purpose, grit, and courage. And here's the deal. Daring I, sh I should have put this on the cover. Daring, because you don't have a choice. I mean, that's it. If you're going to be alive and get something done, be significant in your life, leave a legacy, you've got to be a daring man. Now, when you are born again, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not, no longer just one who just lives under the culture. You don't live under the, you're not subservient to the culture, but you are a shaper of culture. We're men on a mission, and that mission is Jesus. Colossians 1.17, turn to that. See, I believe you and I can live in such a way that future generations will be grateful we were alive. Colossians 1.17, and, and why I'm going to read this for one reason, because we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. It is so easy to get distracted. Colossians 1.17. Well, I'll start with, uh, let's start with 15, 16. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Verse 17, he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Now, that is a huge concept right there. That is, a, that is a concept larger than Stephen Hawking or any other person who's tried to discount uh, divine design. And that is that what holds things together? Light. Quantum physics has proven, string theory or any of the other things you want to look at have proven that what holds all matter together is magne magnetic energy. In other words, light holds all matter together. What did John say? Jesus came as the word. And he came as the light. So the word was spoken. The word was light. And light, Jesus, holds everything together. If we keep the main thing the main thing, then we are energized by the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, 
will energize your life to be a daring man. But, see, but, but here's the thing. Discipleship, the reason we have these materials, the reason you, are, you and I are doing this right now, is that discipleship is a process. Now, we are committed to the process because the process is committed to the person of Christ. We are committed to the process because the process is committed to the person of Christ. Discipleship is a process. It doesn't just happen. Immediately when you become a follower of Christ, you are grafted into the family of God. But being discipled is the next level. Becoming one whose default is the Word of God. See, we're not booksellers. I'm not trying to sell books. What, what our intention is, is for men to walk through the process of being a fully, uh, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, full human. I mean, to be everything God designed us to be. And we're passionate about what we do. I think you can tell that. I always say this, passion without a process is presumption. It's just, it's just all over the place. Passion without a process is presumption. But a process without passion is just a program. Process without passion is just a program. Got to be passionate about this. Go after it. So it's all about Jesus. He's the center of all creation and the center of our humanness. Number two, chapter two. We're in chapter two. Uh, daring men hold nothing back. I like this whole section in here. And there's a couple of people that talks about Robert Berger and Jim Hunter. And I stood on the, on the mountains outside of Calgary where Jungle Jim Hunter was his name. And uh, Jim was training then, this is a number of years ago, was training uh, for the professional skiing circuit. And he'd been in the Olympics, third place, medaled in the Olympics, uh, downhill and did a number of different disciplines. But I stood up there and I asked him, dude, how do you go 70 miles an hour down a hill, I mean steep, that through these gates, and you've got to make all these gates, and they have iced the course. They, they, it's not just snow, like it's fluffy. They have iced it. It's ice, man. And those, you see them coming around the turns 70 miles an hour. So how do you do that? He said, well, I train hard, train consistently. And then once I leave that gate, I ski with reckless abandon. God, man, I, I have never forgotten that when Jim said that to me. He said, I ski with reckless abandon. And I thought, that's a daring man. That's Robert Berger. And you can read the story in here, uh, who went to the jungles with his two little kids. They just celebrated the anniversary of going down there 40 years ago. And, and, uh, no, it was it 35 years ago? <laughs> I can't remember. One of those. One of those. A long time. And they just celebrated the anniversary of that and took his two little kids, Taylor and Jenna. And he and his wife, Karen, and they went to the jungle in the Amazon from Huntington Beach, California. Bam. San Diego, where they were going to school. Bam. You know, Palos Verdes, where it had been a surfer and all that stuff and uh, POP. So could have been a professional surfer. Could have been, you know, doing all these other things. Got, got radicalized in his faith in Christ. And with reckless abandon, he and his wife, Karen, went to the jungle. Today, they pastor one of the most significant churches in all of South America, training thousands of pastors on building great churches. Their churches, tens of thousands of people, even through COVID, through that thing of COVID, their church grew. They, they had 500 small groups. They grew to 1,500 small groups, and it's just exponential. Why? Because he just said, we're just going to do this. We just set our face and we're skiing down the mountain with reckless abandon. You know what? That's the kind of man I want to hang out with. And all through this, I'm going to say it over and over. Dangerous men hang out with dangerous men. Daring men hang out with daring men. It's just it's what you do. It's who you hang out with that helps that helps permeate the, the physical core, the, the center of your life becomes those people you hang out with. It's proven over and over. You can look at the ASCH, A S C H. That's a whole other thing. We won't get into it. It's part of my doctorate program I'm going through right now. But the ASH experiment, where peer pressure causes people to look at something, knowing the right answer, and say the wrong answer just because of the peer pressure. And we are not going to be those men, you and I, that bow to the gods of this world and the peer pressure of this world. And the problem is in our world, number three, manhood is in crisis. Check this one out. 
almost half, almost one out of two, 45% of all marriages end in divorce. There are more people living together now than ever in history. And we know the stats are when they do finally get married or if they just stay living together, most of those things break up and they don't break up well. The largest area of divorce, the largest age group, the fastest growing age group of divorce is age 45 to 55. Excuse me, 55 to 64. Got the stat right here, 55 to 64. So this between 55 and 64 is where a lot of divorces are, people are divorcing. Men are becoming restless. I call it the Viagra syndrome. It's, it's chemically induced, but he still thinks he's a player. And so what he hasn't done is he hasn't actually grafted his life in with his wife. They haven't become his one. He's always held out a little part, a little something here. And then bam, there's that moment. And it goes off the rails. And it's disastrous. And it's terrible if they've got children. It's disastrous uh, for both parties. I've been part of watching those things happen. And over and over and over, you get the phone calls. You sit down with people at coffee, and it's just pain and turmoil. Manhood's in crisis. Now, here's, here's another thing. Seven out of 10, if you've got uh, 10 divorces happening, seven of them are, are initiated by the woman. Somebody asked me about this recently. It was a program with Rebecca Hubble. She asked me about that. And I said, I believe with the Sean Hannity uh, company and uh, podcast. And I said, I believe the reason there's seven out of 10 divorces are initiated by the woman is because she grew up and he didn't. She grew up and he didn't. I believe he didn't, he didn't mature. He didn't accept responsibility. Now, let me just do a little caveat on the sidebar thing. If people are regular members of a church, if they're regular attenders of a church, they don't have to be on staff. They don't have to be, you know, part of the leadership. Just if, if they're attending church services at a life-giving church, Bible-believing, life-giving church, the divorce rate falls to only one out of 10. One out of 10 marriages instead of five out of 10. Now think about that. It's a massive difference. People say, well, it's the same all through culture. No, it's not. If people are going to a church, a local church, and that's why we are champions of the local church at Christian Men's Network. We believe the hope of the world is the church. I believe that strong men make strong families. Strong families make strong churches, and strong churches change culture. That's, that's where it's at. So everything we do, all these materials, everything we do is about helping build strong local churches. That's our heart and our vision. You know, um, heroes, I mentioned Lauren Cunningham in, in section one, uh, now uh, session two. One of these heroes, actually later in life for me, Lauren Cunningham was a hero when I was a young man. Met him when I was, I think, 12. My dad introduced me to him. Became a hero. One of my heroes now later in life is a man named Polycarp. He was a man who was trained by actually uh, St. John, the Apostle John. He trained with him as he was young. John was older, but he trained with him, was taught by him, and he became in the 100s. He lived from 101 to 200, right in that area uh, after Christ. And he became the sheriff of the faith. He was, he was sort of the one that said, people came up with new ideas. It's going to be like this. It's going to be like that. And he says, no, no, no. It's what John told me. This is where it is. He became the one because there were so many groups claiming authority and it was like the Wild West. And he became the one that said, no, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. You ever had somebody say, hey, uh, you know, this guy's doing that. You know, did you hear about this or that? And then you, look, you go, well, no, that's not quite how it is. See, the guy's actually a friend of mine. And they go, oh, yeah, well, I didn't mean it. You ever been in one of those conversations? Don't be that guy. First of all, don't be that guy. Don't talk about stuff you don't know, especially about people. But but I've I've had I've done that and said, you know, actually he's a friend of mine. I know him, and, and here's the motivation. Here's why this happens. This is why he did this. And here's, oh, okay, I didn't know that. See, I was Polycarp, and so he wrote letters just like John and Paul. And his letters helped keep the formation of the body of Christ. He affirmed Paul's impossible because people came back to some of his letters and said, I don't know about that guy. So no, 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 he was. And then in 170 AD, uh, he went to Rome. He's encouraging the, the Christians in Rome in 170 AD. And the proconsul of Rome arrested him. They were killing Christians. He, Polycarp knew that. He knew what was going down. 
but he went anyway. He was a dangerous man. He was he was a daring man. He was a courageous man. He said, if I'm going to help build this church, so I got to go there. He went to Rome. They arrested him. And all he had to do, it's a real fascinating thing because it had to do with the incense and that they they would not, the Christians would not burn the incense because it was, in those days, 170 AD, all the incense was about Caesar as, as Christ. And they would have special incense. He was God. He was Christ. He was the one we all, uh, he was a God. And it's special incense. And the Christians said, we will not burn this incense in our homes or around us or whatever. So that was part of them uh, finding out who they were. And then Polycarp says, I, I'm not going to bow my knee. They say, all you got to do is say, hey, I revere Caesar and, and I uh, reproach Christ. He said, I'm not going to do it. Here's what he said. 86 years old. He says, I have served him all my life. He has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul says, you know, we're going to kill you. He says, yeah, go for it. So normally what they had, had done is they would, they would throw them in the wild animals that eat them and lions would tear them up. But for this guy, because of his stature, they decided to, to burn him in front of tens of thousands of people. So they, they grabbed a hold of him. They took him to the middle. They, they had the, the column there that they were going to tie him to. And, and uh, he says, uh, then they're going to take him up there. Polycarp, what a stud. They're going to take him up there, tie him up. He says, no, no, no. He says, I'll, I'll go up there. And he climbs up over the logs that have been put around there. Climbs up and puts his arm around the column of wood there that's going to burn him. He says, I'm good to go. Oh, man. Talk about a hero. The Romans didn't know what to do. So they're like, okay, yeah, set fire to it. They set fire to it. And this is the story that's been handed down for generations. And he didn't burn. Like, like in fact, what happens is, at this point, some guy jabs him with a sword. Blood comes out. Starts extinguishing the flames on that side of his body. Finally, the proconsul says he's not burning. It was a miracle. And, uh, and they, he says, just kill him, just kill him. And they start stabbing him to death. And in all of that, there's this amazing prayer. And at the end of it, he says, I stand here today because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That's a daring man. That's a man who has on the inside of him strength that goes beyond himself. How do you do that? It's just a guy. You can't. But the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit is what makes us daring men. Number four, daring men hang out with daring men. Watch this. Number five, let's go to the book, page 50. And it's the story of Joshua. And Joshua, a man who believed in a big God. Joshua's an amazing man. He's also a man of wisdom. I want to hit that for a moment. We'll look at different aspects of Joshua's life as we go, book, go through the book, Darren. Joshua has been taught by Moses how to be a man of wisdom, right? Moses is a man who knew how to do that. Taught as a young man, taught by God later in life. He's a man of wisdom. He's also a warrior, knows how to be a warrior, knows how to fight. Knows that victory is always on the other side of a fight. He's been taught how to be courageous and trustworthy and a man of faith. Uh, Joshua's a stunning man. He's one of the 12 spies that goes into the promised land, spies it out, comes back and says, this place is awesome. Now, all 12 spies said that, but only two of them said they could have it. Ten of the spies said, there's bad guys here. There's going to be a fight. We can't do it. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, no, no, we can take these guys. We can take him. And Joshua is that kind of man. And Joshua is a warrior. And Joshua now has been given leadership of the nation of Israel. You know that whole part. And we'll go into more of it later. But 
Moses has died. Actually, at 120 years of age, God takes Moses away and Moses dies. God buries him, seals him up, and then tells Joshua, be strong and of good courage. You're the leader. And Joshua's ready. He's ready to take leadership. And, and it's I love this. It says, Joshua was gifted with the spirit of leadership to take the Israelites into the promised land. God confirmed it with a miraculous crossing of the Jordan River. Also, he, he, beat, he defeated Jericho. He had victory over the Amalekites. That was the time where Moses had his hands up. Uh, Jericho, miracles. He encouraged the people to choose uh, God over anything else. He did everything that God had commanded Moses. He did it. And here's what it says in Joshua 21, 45. Joshua 21, 45. Not one of all the Lord's good promises did to Israel failed. Every single one was fulfilled. He was a man of wisdom. God gives wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. Knowledge and discernment. Wisdom. In the book of James, it says, it says, James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If a man needs wisdom, let him ask of the Lord who will give it to him without reproach. If you're going to be a daring man, you've got to do it with wisdom. Because wisdom always produces the right strategy, and the right strategy gives you victory. So if victory comes from strategy, strategy comes from wisdom. And Moses imparted into Joshua, and in the Spirit of God impregnated Joshua with a spirit of wisdom. For you and I, let's look at Jeremiah 29, 11 as we close today. And I love this. It's in the, it's in the book. It's, I think, page 52. Jeremiah 29, 11 in the Amplified says this. For I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. I love that translation of it. I know the thoughts I have for you, says the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is, and this in Jeremiah 29, this is sort of a parenthetical insertion. It's kind of just inserted in the middle of a number of other things that are going on, instructions to Israel and, and the word that Jeremiah is giving them. And then God says, wait a second, wait a second. You've heard a lot of things from a lot of people about who I am, but I know the thoughts I have for you. They don't know. I know. They don't know. See, those people, they will tell us, whether it's on Facebook or in a small group or meeting somewhere for a drink or a cup of coffee, somebody will tell you, well, you know, what you ought to do is this, and you know about this, and you know, uh, you can't really rely on this, and boy, if I were that. You know, listen, they don't know. God says, I know the thoughts I have for you. It's like starting a business. How many people will tell you, yeah, I don't know. You know, I had an uncle who tried that, went bankrupt twice. You know, there's always that. There's always negativity. But Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts for your success, welfare, and peace, not for evil, not for your destruction, but give you hope in the final outcome. God says, I know they don't know. I know they don't know. And that is the spirit of Joshua. That's a daring man where we trust the word of God. We move beyond, listen, we move beyond faith, if you will. We actually trust them. I got faith in them. No, no, no. Trust was when we actually say, I'm going to do what God showed me to do. Number six, close. Acts 2.17. mentioned it last week. I'll mention it every time we go through all nine sessions. This is number two. Nine sessions of the book, Daring. Oh, hey, and order these. If you, if you order them then the first time you saw this, if you were watching it right when we first went live, on uh, YouTube, then uh, they were back ordered for two days or three days or something. But anyway, grab this. There's also a PDF you can get. We'll download that. Ask for that. Write to me at paul at cmn.men, paul at cmn.men. We'll give you a PDF study guide to go through it. And uh, that's all available to you. Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. To prophesy means to speak life. All of this, everything that we're doing is a radical call to biblical masculinity, to be the man who stands up to confront boldly, courageously, listen, in love and with grace. In love and with grace. See, we don't follow a philosophy. It's not like we're trying to uh, give somebody a theological treatise 
we follow a person. His name is Jesus. So when we share our faith with people, we share Jesus, him crucified, right, for our sins, resurrected, living, and to give us hope. See, discipling men, and what we do in discipling men is about reforming our thinking into his image, the new birth, the conversion process, a man recreated in God's image from his heart to his hands. Not just from our hands to our heart, but from our heart to our hands. That's part two of nine of daring. And uh, tell somebody about it. You know, send them the link. Uh, put a note on there if you're on YouTube. Put a little like thing on there. Put a I, There's something else to punch, right, Jesse? There's other stuff to hit. Hit something on there, you know, where you follow us, subscribe. That would be a good thing. Christian Men's Network, subscribe to the CMN YouTube. The more subscribers, the way the algorithms work, uh, the more people that they'll show us to. So I'll see you next time. I'm fired up about this whole series. Thanks for being with me today. Remember, hope is alive. Hope has a name. Hope's name is Jesus. Stay daring, brother.